Hello everyone and welcome to Starts at 60's newest online masterclass, Stress-Free Ways to Declutter and Sell Your Home. I'm Rebecca Wilson, your host today and the founder and CEO of Starts at 60. If you're not already part of the Starts at 60 community, I'll give you a quick rundown on who we are. Startsat60.com is the online home of the Australian baby boomer. We've got media, a marketplace, travel and insurance offers for you, and a great membership platform that arches over all of it, giving you access to exclusive information like these masterclasses and better deals for our community. To do that, we work with partners who also really care about older Australians to provide information, products and services you value. Today's masterclass has been created in partnership with Aveo, the provider of some of Australia's most desirable retirement communities with 94 retirement and aged care communities across Australia. So if you're interested in downsizing into a retirement community, Aveo has property options well worth considering. And I'd like to say a great big thank you to Aveo for working with us on this masterclass today. Now, on to the next bit. Before I introduce today's brilliant panel of experts and we kick things off, I want you to understand how the day will work, how the session will work. We'll have about 35 minutes of discussion with our panel then about 15 minutes to answer your questions. We have the chat functions running so you can engage with other people while we're talking. Uh, we just ask that you be nice and respectful. Um, we're not taking questions from the chat, only those submitted via the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, so type in your questions in Q&A and our team is sitting live behind the scenes and will do their absolute best to feed those questions into us, just like magic. Um, for the end session, there'll be about 15 minutes of question and answer time. If we can't address all of your questions today, we'll follow up the most pressing ones in articles on Starts at 60 over coming days and weeks. It's just another great reason to sign up as a member is to get those emailers packed with information. So over to our panel. Anyone who's loved Better Homes and Gardens, and I know I watched it for decades, <laughs> uh, will know Julia Zayeda's work. Julia was the editor-in-chief of Better Homes and Gardens magazine for more than 18 years. I think she worked there for 40 years. Um, <laughs> and, um, and she helped create the TV show as well as the Better Homes and Gardens real estate business. So there's not much she doesn't know about owning, beautifying, renovating or selling a home. Julie has also just been through the downsizing process herself and is in the midst of a new decluttering project at her apartment. So she understands what it's like to do this in a real life situation. Uh, and she could be in her 60s, big we're not sure. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> a big hello to all of you. And it's wonderful to be here to talk about one of my most favourite subjects. Does not necessarily mean myself. Personally, I'm good at it. But I'm very good at suggestions for all of you. You can see behind me how, how well I declutter. Thank you for joining us, Julia. Great pleasure. <laughs> and then to get the inside information on the property market, we are really lucky to have Eliza Owen talking to us. Eliza is the head of Australian research at CoreLogic, one of Australia's biggest property data companies. Eliza analyzes the latest moves in property markets across Australia. So she doesn't just know all the current trends, but also knows what we might see on sales and valuations over coming months. Eliza's an economist, which means she's great at anticip oh, anticipating how wider events in financial markets, the economy and politics might impact property. And she's got some really useful insights into what might be a good time to sell right now, as well as when you might want to avoid selling. So Eliza, thank you for joining us and making time to talk today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Now I want to make the most of everybody's time. So let's get straight to the questions we've got programmed in for today. Um, Eliza, you told us recently that you'd seen a real change in the property market in September. Can you explain what you saw in the data? Yeah, absolutely. So I think after the initial shock of COVID-19, which did see a pretty mild decline in property values nationally, September marked a real turn in the housing market with the current conditions slightly better for sellers. Um, we've seen over September the auction clearance rates rose. 
So an average of 64% of properties being taken to auction were selling successfully across the country. And that's only edged up further in the past few weeks. So last week we saw a preliminary clearance rate across the capital cities of 76%. And the auction clearance rate also correlates with movements in price data. So um, when we see the auction clearance rate is rising, we would expect dwelling values to rise as well. And that's what you can see in this graph here. We've seen an increase in uh, most of the capital city property market values. So this graph is a line graph that shows you the rolling monthly change in values of the capital city markets. Um, so each index uh, represents the sort of change in value of the whole dwelling market. So you can see that um, even through the COVID period, there have been increases of about 1% in Adelaide over the past month. Um, Brisbane and Perth are up marginally over the past month as well. And even in Melbourne and Sydney, which saw the biggest shock to prices through COVID because of their historic exposure to overseas migration as a source of housing demand, even the declines across Sydney and Melbourne were easing and Sydney's now back in positive territory over the month. Melbourne, obviously, with extended lockdowns is sort of lagging that growth, but um, ultimately we're seeing an improvement in that market as well. So that suggests that, you know, it's, it's becoming a bit of a better time in terms of getting a better price for your property. Um, days on market is another indicator we look to to understand how demand is tracking. And we've seen in the three months to September, typical days on market was 40 days across the capital cities and 57 days across the combined regional markets. And days on market has shrunk since the three months to July. So that also suggests that demand is ramping up across the property market. And finally, uh, listing volumes are really low. So that means that at a time when demand is starting to rise and things are picking up momentum, we estimate that the amount of stock sitting on the market is about 20% lower than where it was this time last year. So buyers have a little less choice at the moment, and that's why it's sort of becoming more of a seller's market as well. Um, up until the past couple of weeks, we saw that total stock on market was still shrinking while new listings were being added. So that suggests that even as new stuff, even as um, people were listing their property, um, this, the buyer demand was really absorbing those new listings quite quickly. I think that'll be a joy to everybody's ears. Just to repeat that in layman's terms, Eliza, that means the number of properties being put up for sale jumped in September, plus more properties sold at auction than in previous months, and the newly listed properties sold faster. What does that tell you about the sentiment among sellers and does it match how buyers are feeling? Yeah, I definitely think it points to the fact that buyer interest is rising. Sellers are probably still a little bit cautious in some areas. Um, there's a couple of data points we can look to to understand how buyers and sellers are feeling. On the buyer's side, one of the most important indicators we've tracked through the pandemic has been the Consumer Sentiment Index. So that's an index that is produced by Westpac and the Melbourne Institute. And the, the index soared, absolutely soared for October. It's up by about 12%. It's sitting above 100 now. And an index above 100 suggests positive sentiment in the market. Now, why that's important is because consumer sentiment measures how people feel about their income prospects, their finances. So if they're feeling more positive, they're going to be more willing to commit to a high value commitment uh, like a property purchase. There is also a subcomponent of that same index, which is the, is it a good time to buy a dwelling index? And that rose by 11% in October as well. So that's telling us that Australians are more keen um, over the past few weeks, they've become more keen to get out and buy property. Now, on the seller's side, I don't think a lot of people realise that it actually could be a really good time to sell. Listing numbers are low relative to where they were last year. Uh, and that's not just Melbourne, where social distancing really restricted the transaction of property. It's prominent in Brisbane. Um, it's prominent across uh, Sydney and Melbourne as, um, as well. 
um, demand and price changes do vary a lot by sub-markets. So there are inner city unit markets, which have been more uh, impacted by the virus and uh, stock is accumulating a little more across there. But you can see in this listings graph, that yellow line represents the number of new listings being added to the market through 2020. You can see how low the yellow line is relative to the dark blue line above it, which represents the stock coming onto the market through 2019. So even though we've recently seen a jump in new listings of restrictions have started to ease across Melbourne and, and more people are starting to sell, the stock is still relatively low. So that puts sellers in a, in a better sort of position. Wow, we keep on hearing, of course, that Australia doesn't have one property market. It has hundreds. And a lot of the news tends to focus on capital cities, but a lot of sort of our over 60 community live outside the capital cities. What's happening in regional areas, Eliza? Yeah, since the onset of COVID-19, regional markets have generally outperformed the capital cities. Uh, it's not all because of COVID-19. We saw in migration trends before COVID-19, so to say June last year, there were these big movements of people from Sydney to the mid-north coast to the Illawarra region. Um, there were big movements of people from Melbourne to Geelong. There were movements from Brisbane to the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast. I think the one thing that COVID-19 has done has kind of normalised remote work uh, and made it acceptable for people to work from home. And for that reason, it may have amplified the trend of people moving to regional areas because being close to a CBD doesn't necessarily have to be factored into the purchasing decision at the moment. Um, so looking at regional New South Wales, listings volumes are still about 25% lower than they were this time last year. Prices in regional New South Wales are up 5.5% in the year. Um, some of the strongest regional markets across uh, uh, New South Wales are uh, Illawarra, which is up 10% in value over the year. Uh, the Newcastle and Lake Macquarie region is up 7.6%. And across Richmond Tweed, we've seen values up 6% over the year. The Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast are very strong property markets. They were previously, even before COVID, the most uh, among the most popular areas of internal migration, which is people moving from one part of Australia to another. So they saw an additional 6,000 people in terms of uh, migration over 2019 before COVID. Um, and we've seen that values across both the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast are up by about 6.5% over the year. So that means when looking at a tree change or, or sea change area, um, it might be a bit more of a competitive market to buy in at the moment. Um, capital city values have generally seen higher growth in the long term, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. So if you are in a situation where, you know, you've been in one of the capital city markets for a long time, you should still have plenty of purchasing power in, in the regions. But definitely we've seen a very strong performance from certain regional markets uh, over the past 12 months, and they've been very resilient through COVID as well. It's a really interesting that a trend towards regional living is so evident in the numbers. I want to jump to Julia now, who knows a bit about regional property owners, because she is one. Julia, you've got an apartment in Sydney, as well as a house in regional New South Wales. Have you noticed the difference between the two property markets? Look, uh, we have, and it's been absolutely surprising because our, prop, uh, our apartment in, in Sydney is quite close to the bridge. So it's in a very lovely part of Sydney. And our property down in, in is just pretty much in the Illawarra, I'm thinking, Eliza. Um, it's halfway between Goulburn and Moss Vale. And well done, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, because it's remained static probably. We've had it for 20 years and we just go down on the weekends. But we've, we've noticed that in the last year or so, what would normally have taken our, our property maybe three months if we were lucky to sell it, right now if we put it on the market, the properties in our area and, and particularly along our road are going within the week. And the value of that property down there, which has been much, much less than the, than the, the, the Sydney property, is now equal. And uh, we think if we wait a little bit longer, that property will probably surpass the value of the city one. 
which is an extraordinary phenomenon. And the other thing about that, about, about the property down there is um, it's pretty much full all the time with Airbnb requirements and requests now. And in fact, I was talking to somebody this morning who said the bigger and more glorious the property, the more likely it is to be an Airbnb because those people just come down irregularly. And so now the accommodation down there is amazing. But it's, it's extraordinary what's happening with the property values down there. Eliza, you're seeing the same? Yeah, I think um, it, it's definitely something that we saw before COVID, right? I think Illawarra had a very strong um, kind of boom period before the onset of the pandemic. I think if anything, it's sort of um, perhaps uh, that cycle is easing now and, and growth rates will start to soften a bit because it, it can only grow so much. Um, but certainly it's been a, a very strong performing area. I think as well, the point you make about the Airbnb, Julia, the, the bigger and grander it is, you know, it's it, it, for someone who's living in a small apartment in the city, something like that is just a, a fantasy getaway, you know, um, gets together with all their friends and, and has a weekend away. I think it makes total sense. Well, we're actually thinking of doing it ourselves. And this very day, I was sort of signing things up because um, for city people who come and stay, when they wake up and there's six kangaroos just outside the bedroom window, they get very excited. For us, they're the pests and we just wish they'd eat the weeds and they won't. But um, so we can actually see the, the, the joy for people who've not got a chance to come out into the country to come and stay and just watch you know, wake up looking across the rolling hills with the sun coming in, uh, apart from the kangaroos and the wombats. And Absolutely. the snake in the dam. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. I'm a city <laughs> slicker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the property itself still matters, right? No matter where you're selling. Um, what sells a property is something I know you've been developing a real feel for, Julia. Um, yes. The broader events that Eliza explained were fueling an improvement in buyer sentiment, and that's really important. But what can a seller do? Because we have a lot of potential people who are looking to downsize in our community who've come along today. Um, but what can they do to make their property more attractive to buyers? Look, it's it's fairly simple. There's the, there's the basics that, that you need to consider, and that is that you're Home really needs to be clean because nobody wants to walk into a place that doesn't feel as though it's, it, you, can, you can go feeling for the dust or you can rub your hand along the walls or the, the carpet and the floor are absolutely fabulous. And back in the cupboards in the kitchen, you want to know that it's clean. So a coat of paint um, is a really good and, and easy way to, to spruce your house up immediately. And, you, and, and as we say, sugar soap brightens up marked walls or you can just clean the walls as best you can. The other really, really, really critical thing is space. Everybody wants to know that they can move around and that they can put their things out and about and that they have got space to live together and to live apart. So you need to make sure that there's room for each of you to have your own area or that you can put things that you want to put in as well. So take out most of your stuff if you can, but it's equally as important to leave the things there that make it feel like a home because you can only trick buyers to such an extent when they walk in and they think, well, there's nowhere to sit or I can't put bedside tables beside the bed because there's not enough room. So you need to remain re realistic, but clean out as much as you can. And I think the critical thing about going into a home more than anything else is it has to feel right. You have, you have to love the sense of it when you walk in as best you can. So you need to, as the, as the seller, make it feel homey. And what that means is I always think that fresh flowers are critical. They just bring a place alive, fresh flowers, and you can put big bunches, small bunches, a little bunch in the bathroom's a lovely thing. And if, if you can, if it's a dull day, or if you're opening your property later in the evening, Lamps make the most amazing atmosphere. They cozy the place up and they just always say, come in and sit down. And the other thing is, if it's winter, absolutely make sure your home is warm. If it's summer, make sure it's cool. And you can add all the other things like soft music and baking and coughing, coffee, but you really, really need to make the place feel like home. So when people come in, it feels good. That's, that's what it is. You want them to want to be in your place. 
That is fantastic advice. To give us some context, and thank you, Julia, to give us some context um, on how important it is to make your home as saleable as possible. Eliza, can you tell us how many other properties a seller might be competing against in the average capital city suburb? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So what we've seen for the past 12 months is that the average stock on market across the capital cities like Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne has equated to about 5% of the stock or an average of about 30 listings per suburb um, on the market uh, over the month of September, say. But the thing is, it's going to be so varied (laughs) depending on where you are. One of the interesting things about COVID is that it's had a very particular impact on property where suburbs that had a high exposure to overseas migrants as a new source of housing demand, suburbs where there are a lot of people working in hospitality, tourism and the arts, suburbs where you had... um, you know, students living in in apartments. So um, these are really the inner city areas. That's where COVID-19 has really impacted the economy and it's where it's really impacted the way that we live, Um, especially with borders closed, students, you know, studying from home. So there are areas including, you know, Melbourne, South Bank, um, the city of Brisbane that are high density and they have... um, very high levels of listings. That also includes um, areas which may be further from the city, but they're very urban and they're highly exposed to overseas migrants like Parramatta um, and Blacktown. But then we've got areas like Canada Bay in Sydney's inner west, which has had just one listing, you know, over the month of September. These areas that are full of family homes, that have spacious homes and are very appealing um, to a lot of the buyers who are in the market right now, given that, you know, investors have really come out of the market and it's much more about the first home buyer, the upsizer. Um, And so, you know, you wouldn't be competing against as many people in in places like that um, because the demand is a lot stronger, I would say, than the number of people who are are willing to sell or motivated to sell at the moment. Yeah, wow. Let's dig a bit more into that, Eliza. What about the buyer? We hear a lot about first-time buyers, but are they the biggest buying group or should sellers be thinking about families with children and older buyers now? Yeah, good question. So um, I think there is a bit of a generational sweet spot at the moment when it comes to the millennial generation. The millennials are the largest adult generation in Australia And they're currently around um, 26 to 36 years old. The interesting thing about that age group is that we look, if we look at ABS housing and occupancy data, that tells us that that's the typical age that you're buying your first home. Uh, And in that, um, the upper part of that age bracket, you'd be buying your second home or, or a family home. So we've got the largest adult generation in Australia moving through that age group, which is why, uh, or part of why, demand has risen in that segment. So you can see that with this data. This is data from the ABS. On the left-hand side, the, the column graph shows you the rate of change in housing finance that's been given to the first home buyers, the changeover buyers, so that's downsizes and also upsizes. And then that teeny tiny column uh, with growth of 0.1% over the past few months is investors. Now, if we think about investor stock, they're typically looking for low maintenance apartments, perhaps closer to the cities and things like that. So that's where we've seen investors have really not had much growth in the market in, in the current environment, potentially because they're cautious about investing. And also we know our traditional rental markets don't have very good return at the moment because of the closure of international borders. But the owner-occupier first-home buyers and the owner-occupier changeover buyers have seen very strong growth um, in the three months to August. The line graph on the right-hand side shows you the portion of the owner-occupiers that are first-home buyers over time. Now, you can see that really jumps around 2008. And that's because we were going through a house price correction. So prices got lower and a lot of first home buyers jumped in because prices were low, but also because the government had introduced uh, a temporary boost to the first homeowner grant. So really incentivizing them in. What we see now is that 
first home buyer participation has been trending up um, ever since 2017, where we did have a house price correction. Now we're seeing an increase in first home buyer participation because they are um, getting grants from the government to build new homes, to, you know, they're seeing discounts to, um, to purchase new property. I guess that's one of the things to be aware of with the first home buyer segment is that yes, they are increasing. Yes, we are seeing more demand, um, but a lot of the grants being targeted at them are for the purchase of new property, not necessarily established homes. Uh, we do know that first home buyers tend to prefer established, but um, I think that at the moment there's probably going to be a bit more in the new house and land and things like that. Um, so I think it's really the changeover buyers, people buying their, their second home, the family home, they're going to be looking more in the established market and they're probably a bit more prominent than the first home buyer at the moment anyway. So it's a pretty exciting reality to think for our, our um, baby boomer people who often own a big family home and are looking to free up a bit of cash and, and move to a new lifestyle. That it's exciting to think that there's a buyer of those houses right now. Absolutely, they're, they're <laughs> um, in the market. It's good news. That, that's really good. So uh, I'm now going to flip to Julia. So buyers will tend to be looking for a property they can imagine living in themselves. You mentioned space was what many buyers looked for, Julia, but when you've lived in a home for a long time or you've lived a full life with lots of interesting experiences, the space in your home can get pretty full of belongings. And I know you've got personal experience of that. How many cushions did you say you have? Right now, if I swung it around, I've got 26 cushions on three couches. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've downsized considerably in the last little while. Um, and as pe when people come into my place and say, you've got too much stuff, I say, no, my place is too small. <laughs> if I moved into a five-bedroom place with an enormous living room and dining room, I'd be absolutely fine. Oh, bless you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about your personal experience of space and clutter and... and... Well, look... Um, the uh, decluttering is a, is a particularly love of mine, though I don't do it very well. And I'm training myself to because it really matters to free yourself up. You can see behind me here, this is a years of collecting books and, and uh, pictures like my partner and I when we launched a magazine called New Woman. And so there's, I've got um, a, a home full of all those things that matter. And as I say to people, and I'm sure everybody who's watching here, I say to people, point to anything and I will tell you the story that goes with it uh, because they're, they're, that's the reason why you keep things in your home and why you keep, seem to amass more and more and more because everything has some meaning, whether you buy it yourself or whether somebody gives it to you, you've got a story that goes with it. So the, the thing that, that matters now for people who are going from those big houses down to the small ones, decluttering really matters. And it also matters to declutter when you're moving, so you're not taking uh, masses of things that you don't really need and ultimately you don't want. And I think one of, the, one of the tests is, having moved into a smaller place, I have a lot of boxes uh, in storage in the garage of things that I didn't bring in, all that have meaning. If you were to ask me what was in those boxes, I would have no idea. So it just means to say that you can love something and let it go and free yourself up. Oh, you're so right about the connection between things and memories, Julia. And in yes. your 60s, sometimes it's not only your own memories, that memories that are attached to people that belong to your parents oh, and, yes. and your children. I know my mother used to carry around a whole lot of stuff that my brother uh, left at her house for years and uh, would move that with her. Um, how do you separate memories from things so that you can actually declutter? Um, are there ways you can preserve memories while getting rid of things? Yeah, oh, look, I think it can be, I think it can be really quite strong. And, and that, that test that I said about um, if you have things in boxes, you probably won't even remember what's there, which just goes to show that you can let things go and you will be okay. That's what you have to know. You will be okay when you let those things go. But I thought one of the things that was a really lovely thing to do, when you've got lots of little things that have meaning, you can do a beautiful job of going around and photographing them all and then creating your own book. And you know, we can make books out of anything and create your own book of the family collectible. So it's, it's, it's like, a, and it's probably going to be a few 
pages. Let's go anywhere between 20 and maybe 100. But can you imagine how beautiful that book would be because you could write a little caption, a little story under everything, but you can then let it go because you don't actually need things to be sitting on your shelves to be meaningful for you. But if you need to keep things, one of the good things you can possibly do is you buy decorator boxes. They're just very simple. And what you can, and, and as a result of them being simple, they're great for storage. But the other thing is that you can line the bottom of bookcases or you can indeed put them on top of bookcases and they look like decorator items in themselves, but they're storing tons of your stuff just to free up shelf space, walking space, seating space. And then with the important things that matter, like your files, as we say here, a slightly slim filing cabinet tucked away is pretty much all you need for the important paperwork. And it's really critical to have one of those. Otherwise, you've got papers all over the place that you can't do much with. And they actually make you feel cluttered, even though a lot of paperwork can't, can't do it um, specifically and, and physically. And I like the idea of, you know, you can take baby clothes and turn them into quilts, children's art into photo canvases, and I've got bunches of them. I know you have too, Rebecca. It's the art on my wall is what my son did at school. And it's a lovely way to, to keep, keep hold of those treasured items but, and, and, and release yourself of the things that don't matter. Um, and then you can use shadow boxes, like we say. And the last one is your mother's china. I don't know how many of you have got your mother's china and I guarantee it's a whole lot of you. Small jugs, um, sets of spoons, I could probably grab a few here if I looked around. Let me just pick out mum's little jug from here. And this is just, you know. I've got great grandmas and grandmas. <laughs> how many of these do we have in our life? You know, and we tuck them away because they matter because they were our mothers. Use them. If they're so important and they're so pretty, bring them out and use them instead of just leaving them sitting there. Because when you use them, you'll shelve them accordingly, but you'll get much pleasure from the fact that you're bringing them out and doing something with them. Because it's a really sad thing to leave something that's pretty just sitting there and not giving it its proper use. So they have inspired me. Yes. <laughs> my grandfather brought my grandmother, uh, uh, whenever he travelled to Sydney from Brisbane, a teacup saucer and side plate in a beautiful set um, now, in all of those Royal Daltons and everything. So I have a cupboard upstairs with all different ones from my grandmother's collection. Um, that I don't use because it's double double glazed so that my son doesn't kick a football in the house and destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was I was at a tea shop the other day just to, drinking tea and instead of having giving us ordinary cups like we get everywhere, they brought out the most beautiful cups you can imagine. And I thought, oh, isn't this good? It just makes you feel a little more special. And for whatever reason, it makes your tea or your coffee taste better. So, Rebecca... Bring them out. Use them. All right. You've got yes. me on this. So yes. I'm going to come to the next question now because we, I could talk about decluttering the beautiful things forever oh, yeah. and I want to hear more. So if someone does want to try and separate memories from items, Julia, you've got some really strong tips for decluttering as painlessly as possible. Do you want to walk us through those? Look, yes, I will. I think, I think, what you know, I think for starters you need to get into the headspace and convince yourself that really you are going to declutter. And, and if it's going to be difficult, you need to let yourself know that you're going to pursue it and you're going to go through it to the end because you'll put it off and put it off and put it off. Start it, believe that you're going to declutter and actually declutter. So for starters, the smaller items, and there's an Italian expression that is bebe. And bebe is two little words that mean beautiful, beautiful. And what it actually also means is that you've got a whole lot of stuff, bebe, that are just really pretty like this little gorgeous bird that came from the Chelsea Flower Show, you have them all over your house. Look at them, see whether you actually, actually need them and just those that you don't, box them up and decide where you're going to, get, where you're going to put them and I'm going to come to that in a minute. That's the first thing. Move the smaller things from your home so you can start on the bigger ones and ultimately the, the furniture. If you just put them aside and see whether you miss them terribly, and then when you've decided what that is, we're going to talk about the fact of where you're going to give them or where you're going to sell them. The same with your larger items. And if you've got a lot of those, you just need to look at them, feel them and see, if I didn't have that, would I be okay? 
move them out of sight, move them away and see whether you miss them. And nine times out of 10, you won't, which enables you to make your decision about letting them go and how you're going to do it. And then if you're struggling, get your family or your friends to come in who'll tell you every single time, oh, for goodness sake, get rid of that. You haven't used it for years. It won't matter if it's gone. And sometimes the honesty of other people really helps you. I have a friend who comes and visits me often and what she will do is she'll get up earlier than me in the morning. Everybody would love this. She'll get up earlier than me in the morning and she'll start cleaning my place for me before I'm even up. So she'll have dusted the legs of the dining room table or she will rework the pantry, you know, when you don't want people in your pantry. And she always says to me, I'll get rid of all this dead people's furniture. It's just, it's just weighing you down with dead people's emotions. Let it go. I do query her on the value of antiques on that one. But sometimes I look around and think, yes, yeah, she's right. Do I really need to keep that ugly little table just because mum had it? So, you know, get some honest opinions from, from friends. And real estate agents are wonderful too if you're going to bring them in and they'll tell you to clear things out. And, and the other thing is that I find is really good. You go on websites like house.com that has thousands of the most exquisite pictures of very beautiful spaces, indoors, outdoors, kitchens, bathrooms, whatever you want. You will fall in love with some and chances are, or probably it's more likely that you're going to like the ones that have fewer things. Decide that you want that in your house and that's going to drive you a little more to be able to let things go um, eat more easily than you thought. Then I want you to learn how to sell your items. I, f right now, Facebook Marketplace, I love to death because you can buy things inexpensively and they're lovely. And you, if you put things on Facebook Marketplace, you'll be amazed at the response that you get to get rid of things. Down in the country property, my other half bought this stupid stove that we don't need that's out in the barn. I thought I'm going to get rid of it. I want someone to come and pick it up. I put it on Facebook Marketplace, I think about a week ago, I've now had something like 10 requests for people to come and get it. And I'm only charging $5, which is ridiculous, but I just keep on getting these requests. The other thing that happens if you start to sell your items, you become obsessed with it because it's lovely that people actually want what you're letting go. And a little bit of extra cash is very good. Someone said to me, you become obsessive about it because it's such a good feeling that you can't stop selling. You do have to know when to stop. But the other thing is, and this is critical too, if your items are expensive, like I have two glorious lust of vases that my mother had, I'm sure they're worth a whole lot more than Facebook Marketplace at $5. Find the auctioneers. And if you go online, you'll be able to find auctioneers who sell that beautiful stuff. And you're probably better going to them with the things that really matter instead of just letting them go. And if you've got a lot of your relations, um, things that have come down through the years, your grandmother and your mother, you'll, you'll have them. So they, they mean a lot. So it's good if you get the respect of an auctioneer who understands their value. I'm, I'm continuing here because there's still a lot <laughs> good, of Good, good. I love this advice. You've got me with open <laughs> ears. <laughs> you know, if you're really, really torn on an item, put it away for longer. You know, you can visit it, put it down in the garage, put it in a cupboard, just, just learn to come to terms with it. And then if three days turns into 10 before you visit it, you'll, you'll realise that you're not missing it. Uh, and, and you can then decide to let it go. Then the, the, the really good thing is just imagine your home squint and imagine your home cleaner, neater, with more space and less less fuss. Would I be better off with six cushions instead of 26? Yes, probably I would. And I'll have to see how I, I can get them. Now, this is going to be a sad process because it's really wrenching yourself of things that have mattered to you for a long time and things that have stories and memories. So allow yourself to be really disappointed. If you have to sob and weep over something, do it. But you need to continue with the strength if you're really determined to clutter to declutter and I, I think it's critical just for our emotional well-being and because something has given you great pleasure or whatever it's done for you kept the memories alive thank the item as it goes out the door or in the box for what it's given you and you'll feel a whole lot better about letting it go.
that's just beautiful about advice. Like just that. gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> that is just fantastic. I, I, uh, I feel completely coached through being ready to declutter uh, section. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking what I'm going to do with my little Chelsea bird. Oh, I even know. I'm hard, uh, hard pressed to detach myself from things like that. Yes, now I'm going to yes. jump back to Eliza now because with Julia's tips, hopefully we're all feeling like we can get our homes ready to sell at the right price. Um, and that for, um, we're right in the, the lead up to Christmas. It's a good time to put a property on the market. Eliza, tell us about your outlook for the property market and what we should look out for next year as well. Yeah, thanks. That was awesome, Julia. I want to, <laughs> I want to go, I want to go home and declutter. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, yeah. Um, look, in terms of the market outlook and where we're going, I think there there has been a lot of apprehension around COVID. But the interesting thing about a negative economic shock is that the RBA will tend to lower the cash rate. They they undergo this process of making debt cheaper to try and stimulate the economy. And so funnily enough, when that happens, house prices actually tend to rise because mortgage rates are lower and Australians are very responsive to that. So next week, we're anticipating that the RBA may actually lower rates again down to a record low 0.1%. This would make mortgage rates even cheaper. And so by that logic, which we've observed historically, I'd imagine prices are going to be coming up again in the near term. The main kind of headwinds that we're looking out for, which could put property demand at risk, would be around March next year, we've got the end of mortgage repayment deferrals. Now, that's the program that was implemented by a lot of banks that meant if you'd lost your job during COVID, you may have been able to freeze your mortgage payments. If they sort of have to face up to their debt and they still can't repay it, then they might have to put their property on the market and, and sort of be forced to sell. And that uplift in listings could put downward pressure on prices. But I think ultimately um, we're probably looking at an uplift in prices for the next three to six months at least. Um, the other thing is that the RBA have indicated they're not looking to increase the cash rate again for at least three years. Mm. So that suggests that monetary policy could be quite accommodative to housing market growth for a long period of time. And even when the cash rate does start to come up again, it'll be because the economy is booming and more people have jobs. And so um, people who do take on a mortgage um, by that time, they, they will hopefully be in an employment position where they can continue servicing it. Oh, there's a lot of people here who've seen previous property booms come come from yeah. tough times and uh, I'm sure they, they've got a speculative hunch on, on their own position on the property market too. There's something else I wanted to touch on because it doesn't often get talked about in terms of property, but it's really relevant to older Australians and that's the time in market. I know you've got some really interesting data, Eliza, that puts in context the sell now or sell later question. Yeah, so I actually think when it comes to property, it is exhausting and kind of pointless to, to worry yourself with day-to-day -day movements in the economy and, and wonder what's the best day or the best month to sell. Um, there is no point trying to time the market. I think it's really time in the market that matters. So we've done this analysis. This was based on resales of property. So um, properties that had been purchased and, and resold with the resale date over the June quarter, which remember was, you know, where we were capturing some of the worst economic data around the pandemic in terms of GDP and unemployment. And we took the median nominal um, uh, change between the initial um, purchase and the resale over the June quarter um, by the amount of time the property was held. So from this analysis, you can see that nominal price changes, first of all, at, at the median sort of aggregate level, the, the median return on resales has been a profit. That's why none of these figures are minus. But you can generally see you've got your years that the property was held along that bottom horizontal axis. And the more time, as we see, more years of a property being held going along that axis, you generally see there's a higher level of nominal return. So when it comes to 10 to 12 years, the nominal um, profit has been over 150,000. Um, 20 to 22 years, the profit has been over 400,000. 
and the median profit for properties held over 30 years uh, is $570,000 thereabouts. And that's the median, right? So there are going to be people profiting above that and, and below that as well. Um, but that data really just goes to show it's not about timing the market. It's time in the market that counts when it comes to getting value from property. Oh, that is a great point to remember, Eliza. And it really helps us to keep the big picture in mind, which is what you do want from your retirement. I mean, that that's what we're here for to discuss and property is just one of the ways to get there but it's also an enormous enabler for people as they start to want to seek out the best parts of retirement and have places to live that they absolutely love and that add value to the rest of their life um, so i'm conscious everybody's situation is different and that there's plenty of other questions we can cover on downsizing and retirement properties and if this is a topic you've got questions on please join us for another masterclass at 1 p.m. AEST um, or 2 p.m. AEDT uh, on November 17. You'll find details on how to sign up after the event. Uh, over the next few weeks on Starts at 60, we'll be talking all about it. So keep out, an eye out for it in our emailers. Let's try and get through some questions now, though, if that's okay. I've got a, a good starting list that the team have been feeding in um, to us so that we can get talking. Now, I have uh, a question for Julia. Uh, this is something Julia touched on earlier. Julia, a viewer's asked, how do you overcome the emotional barriers to ridding yourself of things that have a great deal of sentimental value? And then where do you put things to be discarded without building up a huge disorderly heap of things in your house? Well, I think one of the, you know, it's very hard and there are going to be things that you don't want to get rid of. It's as simple as that. You're going to hold on to them. So you know, what, Maybe what you start with is the things that really, really matter. And it's sort of like a, 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 a ever a, a widening circle. Start with the ones that really matter, then move out a little bit in your mind and maybe find a space that you can do that with. With the things that you're moving on, and if you're prepared to let them go, you can, like I said, sell them. But I think places like St Vincent de Paul and um, uh, those, the Salvation Army stores, you'll feel very good about things going there but don't beat yourself up too much if there's things that you really want to hold on to because you can declutter in so many other ways than just the, those that matter and you know when you get to our age pretty much everything matters but like I said the, all the things that I've got stored in the garage and they've only been there two years now I have no idea what's in there so am I missing them and there's probably tons of things that matter. So just decide the ones that are really important to you. And then with the ever extending circle, start on the outside and just keep on working your way in. And you know what? If you're not moving, there's no hurry. So just do it in your own time. And what will happen is it'll begin to feel better and better and better. The more you learn that divesting yourself of things is, is cleansing and you'll love it. But hold on to the things that matter most. Oh, you've motivated me too. Another one for Julia. <laughs> this viewer says, I'm looking at retirement in 2022 and downsizing to a property with a smaller yard and less maintenance. My questions are, how do I avoid overcapitalizing on my house while preparing it for sale? For example, I've got an old weatherboard house and I'm keeping the gardens nice and tidy. But how do I know if it's even worth the expense of giving the house a paint to freshen it up since it was last done four years ago? Oh, I think four years ago is fairly recent. Uh, if, if you're considering selling, ask a couple of real estate agents what they think. But you might just need a good, a good gurney wash down just to freshen it a little bit rather than doing a whole paint job, which is a bit expensive. I'd, I'd get the opinions and just try that thought about cleaning it. But I think it's critical that you keep going with your garden. Um, and make that as, as pretty and as lovely as you can and as neat so that when people are coming in, the entrance is neat and they're walking through something that's just, it's just delightful but not overpowering and, and not out of control, as it were. But try washing your house. See how that goes um, because it might be enough instead of having to repaint. Excellent. That's really good advice. The next question is for Eliza. I don't want to pay the fees and commissions real estate agents charge, but are there pitfalls I should be aware of in trying to sell my own home? 
Yeah, so <laughs> I think there are, you know, plenty of channels for selling property without using a real estate agent or there are even hybrid models which consist of fixed fees rather than a commission based on, um, you know, there are those different structures. The thing is the overwhelming majority of vendors will use a um, real estate agent and I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first is that you're selling an asset worth at least hundreds of thousands of dollars and a real estate agent, a good one, will um, ensure that the property is well marketed. They'll be trying to negotiate the best possible price on your behalf. Um, the other thing is having a real estate agent provides some distance between you and potential buyers. Um, the selling of property can be a very emotional process um, and, and it's time-consuming. Yep. Um, so an agent can take the, the stress out of that, right? Um, and, and of course, you know, a good real estate agent will also have a wide variety of, of contacts in terms of a database, a database of potential buyers that could get a transaction done more quickly than if you were trying to do it by yourself. Um, they might also have good contacts in terms of, um, you know, interior designers or, or um, you know, someone who can furnish or, or fix the home or, or something like that. So I guess if you just think about all the work that a real estate agent does, um, you just really want to consider whether it's worth you taking on the process of trying to do online marketing, signage, mm. Um, managing the transfer of finances, um, hosting open homes and inspections. Uh, sometimes it can really help and, and be worth your um, saving your time to employ the services of a professional. And perhaps where you might spend a bit more energy is researching real estate agents to make sure you're getting a good one. You know, how many properties have they sold in an area? What kind of online reviews do they have? Do you know anyone who's uh, recommending a, a good real estate agent. So that might be more of where um, you can invest your time. So obviously it comes down to the individual and, and your own skill set and things like that. But just, I think those are some important things to keep in mind. That's really helpful. And Julia, you had something to add. I, I actually have a question for Eliza while I've been in awe of everything that you've been saying, because it, it, it convinces one that it's okay to sell, like to sell cleverly. What I want to know from you is, given that it's a seller's market right now and it's a very good time to be a seller, you are selling into a market that then turns you into a buyer. So it's not a good buyer's market as such. How do you negotiate that tightrope that you go from being one of the lucky ones to now being one of lots of people who are looking in the marketplace? So is there something to protect you from that? I think that's a really good point, Julia, especially when we consider, you know, if you're looking for a tree change or a sea change, you're going into markets where there have been these um, big uh, increases yeah. in demand for, for regional property. So a, a, a rising market can actually, depending on the market you're in, can actually um, benefit a downsizer. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, if we assume that the market is kind of seeing this uplift at, at um, relatively uniform rates, which historically it has, then you're going to be selling into a market where a more expensive property would be getting more in terms of the dollar value. You'd be seeing more of a profit. And then if you're downsizing, presumably you're buying something smaller where even though the rate of growth might be quite similar to what's happening in the cities or something like that, your purchasing power should still be stronger in the downsizing process. It's harder for someone who's upsizing, right? Because they might yes. be selling in a rising market, selling a cheaper kind of property. But if they're trying to buy something more expensive, then that would be increasing in value more rapidly. That's, I've got a couple more questions to run on to because they, they're queuing them up for us right now. So uh, with only 10 minutes left, we're going to have to get moving. So Julia, I've got three very similar questions. One viewer has a collectible movie books and football cards, plus a full collection of Wedgwood China made especially for the Australian market. Everything's oh, in pristine condition in boxes with authentication papers. Another has a large amount of books, including academic books, and a third is thinking of having a garage sale. 
So I want to ask, how do you know what to sell where? Is a garage sale better than Gumtree or eBay? How do you see it? A garage sale is a very good thing, uh, especially if you've got a garage in a prominent place where people are going to be able to see it and you can promote it around around the corners. It's, it's a lovely feeling when your garage sale ends and you've only got six things left after having had 600. I think with the first question, I would be trying to find one of those auctioneer specialists and getting them to come and have a look at, at, at your goods to make sure that they're not that, that you're not letting something go that it is incredibly valuable. And we know now with some books and particularly with, with LP records, with vinyls, how critically valuable they are. We, we would have thrown them all out some time ago. So I would get an expert to look at that. Um, I think a, a garage sale is a good thing. If you could be bothered stacking it all up and what you've got with the garage sale, you've got probably six to eight hours that you can use it and maybe over two days on a weekend it's a good thing and you'll clear a lot then you can go to the other places um if if, uh, with what's left over if you don't have the opportunity to do a garage sale however i'd go back to those marketplaces but if you can it's lovely to move a lot of stuff very quickly just display really nicely make sure you clean things up um you know wash things if you need to dust them down consider that presentation is pretty much 80% of your sale. So make things look really good and display them well and you'll sell a whole lot more than if you just put them out there. That's really interesting. Now I've got another fun one for you, Julia. This one will drive you nuts. Is it worth getting your house staged by professionals and what roughly does that kind of service cost? If you're selling? Yeah. Well, the real estate agents under normal circumstances now will have stylists who come in and do it for you. They're just as likely to move all your furniture out, some of them, uh, which will will make it sort of expensive for storage, removal and storage. But if you think it's going to be worthwhile and get you an extra $10,000, $20,000 for what they're going to do, by all means, go ahead. Look, it's, it's, it's a, um, I had occasion to be looking for properties in the last couple of years, and I know this is a ridiculous number, but we couldn't find what we wanted and probably saw about 400 places over 14 months. It's terrible. It's not good for your relationship and it's shocking for your well-being to be doing that. But after a little while, you get annoyed with places that are um, decorated and staged because you know that they're being done to fool you into what the place is like rather than giving you the reality of the place. So if you're going to do it, Make sure, like I said before, it still feels homey and like somebody's going to want to come in and it feels good rather than those places that have the same cushions, the same way of decorating the bedroom. And, and for me, they always have that throw across the double bed when you go into those places. And they've either spent half an hour getting the flow right so it looks like you've just tossed it there or they do it really neatly. And it became an obsession of mine at the end that I had to mess up whichever one they'd done because they'd staged it as opposed to decorated it. So it was a home you wanted to live in. But yeah, find out the cost, but it's better that if you've got 26 cushions, get your place staged. (laughs) Another one for Julia. It it looked like they're just rolling in to get help with decluttering. Um, This one you should feel quite, quite entertained by. How do you deal with a husband who just doesn't feel comfortable throwing anything out or giving it away. He's basically a hoarder. What do you do if you desperately want to declutter, but the person you live with absolutely refuses to get rid of everything? Or you have to work out first off how much you love him because there's a sort of thought of divorce in there if you can't remove things. But I think, <laughs> um, and I have a friend whose husband does the same. There's some sort of um, uh, extraordinary attachment to things that if I left go, I'll be left on my own. Now, I, that's, that's his problem. So he's got a garage that's just chock-a-plock with boats and chairs and tables and things, none of which he needs, coupled with the fact that he's got two storage places full of things. I think if you can sit down and just talk through what the need is to keep things, and then maybe with your husband, you go through items one by one with him and you help him let go. And, you know, and just keep on doing it. Keep on going around and going back to that item that you know he doesn't need, but there's some sort of strange attachment to it. And it's not a strange attachment for him. It's a really real one. But if you can actually assist in going, we just need 
to let it go. We need to let it go. There's other things in life that matter to us than just cluttering our space. Let's clear it and clear our mind and then clear our hearts. And you never know what we can do more together if we're not hoarding, but we've got space to do things. I would just perhaps throw that in at the end. More things for the grand, more places for the grandchildren's paintings to go, right? Yes. Or I would <laughs> more spaces to do lovely things together. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> so, Julia, you've told us you moved well over 10 times since you became a parent. Yes. So, you have plenty of experience. How do you find a good moving company? And do you recommend paying somebody to pack? Um, I, I, I've, I've always done my own pack, packing, but uh, the next time I move, I won't um, because I'm done with it. I think you just word of mouth with, with storage companies and companies that you go and talk to them, find out what they're going to do with your boxes, ask them how they're going to pack, when they're arriving in the morning, what do they think is the most important thing about re removing or moving people uh, and, and just evaluate yourself. Uh, go online, check it out. I think boxes matter. And, and if you can afford it, absolutely have them pack for you because they do it very systematically uh, and it's just a whole lot less stress. And I think when you get up to our age, the less stress, the better. We had a moving company that we used often and they were from the country and they were absolutely lovely and very caring. And the last time they moved us, we had so much stuff that by the end of the day, they were just throwing it in the front door and they said, never book us again. <laughs> Goodness. So, yeah, I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> we thank them for all their work. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. Yes, we will try them when we move again, but but they wouldn't come back. <laughs> oh, well, look, I'm, I'm down to our last question for the day, and it's for Julia. It's from a viewer who says, you're solid gold. <laughs> they, ask, <laughs> they ask, what about the enjoyment your children will have in finding out the stories behind items? Are we robbing them of that by decluttering or is it a relief because they don't really want our clutter? What's your thoughts? And I've got something to add from when my in-laws dropped off all the things they didn't want to declutter but oh. didn't want to keep. Yes, that's it. And I'm just I'm <laughs> conscious of the fact that I'm getting the questions because Eliza was so comprehensive. All right, like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you, were, you were amazing. You've made me want to I'm learning as well, so keep... <laughs> <laughs> and we now know we're ready to sell, right? It's time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it really matters. Um, it matters. It matters to take your kids through things and just give them the stories that go with them. But I can guarantee you, they're not going to want those things when you go. So they'll very much appreciate the story, and then they will encourage you to free yourself up. But if you can do the book that I suggested up front, it would be gorgeous for them, and you can do three or four copies. So you photograph all the things that are lovely, and then you put the little captions to them. And however many kids you've got, you give them the book. Can you imagine what a beautiful gift that would be for them? And then that enables you to let the things go. But take your kids through the stories first and then say to them, would you like these things? I'll bet you they won't. They're not going to want my little Chelsea flower show bird here. My son's going to say, it's gorgeous, mum. No, 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 you keep it. Thanks for the story. So give them the story, but they're not going to take it from you. And try the book. Yeah, I've done the book. I have to say it's how I um, how I parted with my children's paintings when they were young was to photograph them and then sneak them to the bin when they weren't looking. Um, and, and I think there's lots of ways you can use that book. And the book company's bed. name, where how you do it is, I've just forgotten, you can take it to Officeworks and get it printed, can you? There's loads of them. Yeah, there's mm. loads of them who'll do it for you. And, and not only that, but you become a, a book author and a book designer, and you will have as much fun producing it as they will receiving it. Isn't that beautiful? Look, we've come to the end of our, our session today. So where um, the video of this event will be live on startsat60.com soon, if you'd like to listen to it in more detail. Um, and you'll see follow-up stories on our site, on Facebook, and in our newsletters. Um, don't forget our next Downsizing Masterclass, where we'll talk to Noel Whitaker, Rachel Lane, 
and Marilyn Graham, an expert from Aveo, in more detail about your downsizing options. It really helps us see the next part of the journey everybody goes on um, for where they live and what the options are. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our fantastic panel. Thank you both for making the time to talk to us. Um, it's just, you've blown my mind. I, I'm, I'm feeling completely motivated to sell and ready to declutter. I can't believe it. Um, would, would you, and, Rebecca, would you like my bird? <laughs> oh, I love your bird, but thank you, but no thank you. I'm gonna leave it with you. <laughs> I have enough clutter. <laughs> what about That's you, what I Eliza? Came. Can I give it to you, Eliza? Oh, go on. Okay, there you go. Right. <laughs> so thank beautiful. you for taking it. Um, so I also, of course, would really like to thank the team at Aveo, Australia's leading and most innovative senior living provider. You can find out more about Aveo at our next masterclass or pop along and visit their website at aveo.com.au, aveo.com.au. They really are a fabulous, fabulous national operation. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon for more discussion on this really time relevant topic. Thank you very much for coming. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.